Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Noel Healy. I'm a professor in the Geography and Sustainability Department here at Salem State. Um, this talk is sponsored by Salem State's Earth Day Committee, um, the Geography and Sustainability Department, and Sunrise Salem, who are uh, student climate activists on campus. Today, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Ulufemi Tewu. Ulufemi is an associate professor of philosophy at Georgetown University and is regarded as one of the most of the US's most prominent philosophers. Um, he received his PhD from philosophy um, uh, or in philosophy from UCLA, and he's published in academic journals ranging from Public Affairs Quarterly, One Earth, which is one of my favorite journals, um, Philosophical Papers and Global Environmental Polit Politics. Olufemi bridges the gap between academia and the public sphere through his thought-provoking scholarship and engaging media and social media contributions. Uh, Femi is very active on Twitter. Uh, his public philosophy, including articles which explore the intersections of climate justice and colonialism, have been featured in The New Yorker, The Nation, Boston Review, Al Jazeera, New Republic, and Foreign Policy. Olufemi has been busy. He published not one, but two books um, last year. Um, these two books, Reconsidering Reparations and Elite Capture, offer a radical and innovative perspective on how to address the historical and contemporary injustices that have shaped our world. In Reconsidering Reparations, he argues that reparations should not be seen as a backward-looking project of compensating or reconciling the victims and perpetrators of past wrongs, but rather as a forward-looking project of constructing a more just and sustainable world where the cost of building a better future are distributed more fairly among those who have inherited the moral liabilities of past injustices. Elite capture is a powerful indi indictment of the ways elites have co-opted radical critiques of racial capitalism to serve their own ends. It identifies the process by which a radical concept can be stripped of its political substance and liberatory potential by becoming a victim of elite capture deployed by political, social, and economic elites in the service of their own interest. So much of today's conversation, I think, will focus largely on this book and issues of climate justice, but we'll also discuss some overlaps with elite um, capture and, and look at some of the synergies uh, between the two books. Uh, and of course, if members of the audience have a question, please pop it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I'll do my best to, to pick out some interesting questions. Olafemi, thank you for uh, being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Okay, so first question is kind of more about you. Um, my my students were interested uh, in knowing how did you get interested in the topics that you write about, and how did you end up thinking and writing about the climate crisis? So in general, um, I try to write about the topics that cross the worlds that I inhabit. Um, so obviously I'm a political philosopher. There are, uh, colleagues in my discipline who I have a set of conversations with. Um, I try to be involved in politics outside of academia, um, particularly in grad school. I was doing, uh, some organizing in LA, which is where I went to grad school. Um, and then there are, you know, still communities outside of that, you know, our artistic communities, just friend groups, so on and so forth. And, you know, whatever topics pop up in multiple of those spaces are the ones that I think kind of attract my interest because um, one of the things that interests me intellectually is just the differences in how the same subjects get talked about in different spaces or different rooms. Um, so that's one of the things that I use to pick out topics to write about and think about. In the particular case of climate justice, I actually got thinking about that from, I think, much more uh, boring kind of standard 
economic political questions. I was a poli sci econ major, and so I just you know was doing wonky reading about you know what what are what's the future of the African continental free trade zone? You know what is economic development strategy look like? Um, in West Africa, um, you know, answering these kind of wonky questions from a Pan-Africanist perspective. But every time I tried to do that in any time window longer than a few years, you know, starting to think about what the world would be like in 2030 and 2040 and 2050, um, all the predictions and projections that people were making really powerfully had were, were tied to the trajectory of the climate crisis and i think you know maybe even more broadly the ecological crisis that we're in you know aside from the temperature and aside from um the rates of co2 and co2 equivalent in the air so eventually i just kind of came at it from the side and just thought you know if this is cropping up everywhere maybe it's something i should think about directly mm -hmm. and and yeah and, and... You, your your book really speaks to this. So if we start off maybe in your first book, can you explain, you know, the title of your book, Reconsidering Reparations? How do you understand reparations and why do we need to reconsider them? So there's been calls for reparations for transatlantic slavery and colonialism pretty much since the inception of those things. They involved grave injustices from the start. Those grave injustices accrued and accumulated problems and costs and disadvantages across generations from the 15th century, right? So we're centuries into people responding to this history, trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, and particularly in the last two to three centuries, um, really mounting serious advocacy struggles for various kinds of reparative justice, um, things that we would now think of as reparative justice, in some cases, things that even then they were calling reparative justice, so on and so forth, um, whether it's uh, the colonization project to return people to um, the African continent, whether it was land concessions and land reform, um, 40 acres and a mule is a common uh, thing people talk about in the U.S. context specifically, um, but people have been fighting for this over a long period of time and in a lot of ways. Um, and all I really try to do in the book is think about um, grouping, you know, the the many, many things people have said into some categories and trying to argue for the category that I think is the best one, which I just call the constructive view just to have something to refer to it. But it's not anything new. It's not anything that I've come up with. It's just a, a way that people have conceptualized what the point of reparations would be. Um, and the other two ways of thinking about reparations, um, I, you, I, I really uh, appreciated your introduction to it in the introduction to this talk. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the nuances people miss, but but it's exactly uh, how you put it. You know, a lot of the ways of thinking about reparations are essentially or primarily backward looking, right? So, um, what was the value of stolen work hours in um, eighteen hundred dollars, and what would that be in twenty twenty three dollars, and so on and so forth? And I don't. Um, have any, you know, deep moral problem with that. I, I think there's just a better way to look at it. Um, there's also a view on which, you know, we look at the harms of the past as um, destroying a social relationship. And we ask how we could repair that past harm that is um, with us in the present in that kind of backward looking way. So it's maybe less about the dollars and cents and more about the stuff of um, apologies or group reconciliation or, you know, maybe even polity or national formation. Um, but there are all these backward looking ways of looking at what reparations is for. Um, and as you said in the introduction, I just give some reasons for liking this forward looking way of looking at reparations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and 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 that really comes across in the book. And I, I'll speak a little bit later about how how the book actually is is quite optimistic. Um, just because I know that other departments in my in Salem State are using this as a as a textbook, so I want to make sure to to have some questions on the elite capture as well. So uh, a similar question. So so what do you mean by elite capture? And as the title says, how did the powerful take over identity politics and everything else? So can you summarize the whole book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so just a little bit of context, um, particularly on the left politically, which is where I find myself um, and you know, the people that I'm most often in conversation with, there's been some suspicion about identity politics, people using it in sort of unprincipled ways, you know, I'm only going to listen to arguments or take political direction from people of this or that social identity or people who use uh, these pronouns or people of this racial identity, whatever it might be. Um, and various leftists have been critical of this and skeptical about it. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in the book, I think the core thing I'm trying to do, do in the book is to acknowledge that there are unprincipled ways that people use identity politics and there are ways um, that the uses of identity politics that we see that traffic most often on social media and legacy media outlets um, often do support uh, kind of uh, narrow view of identity politics that works out the best for people who are maybe class privileged and privileged in other kinds of ways. Um, but all those things are just mundane aspects of politics. It's not some special deficiency of identity politics that um, the way that it's used um, benefits the status quo um, or that there are more radical understandings of this way of thinking about politics than the ones that circulate in universities and so on and so forth right um, one of the quick examples i often give is you know if you popped into the late you know the mid to late 1800s um or or even now um but especially back when slavery was more widespread and legal you would have found people advocating for a version of freedom that include included their freedom to own other people right i don't think it follows from that that the concept of freedom is somehow deficient um but what we should understand is that any politi political concept whether it's freedom or identity politics or socialism um, is going to have a variety of possible interpretations and the people who are often going to win the battles over which uh, interpretations circulate, which interpretations get grant funding, which interpretations end up in news media, um, which interpretations have their uh, believers elevated to platforms and which have their believers, you know, locked in prison. Um, all those things are going to advantage particular parts of the population. We should not be surprised if they advantage people who are privileged in other ways. So that's really the broad thrust of the point that I try to make in the book. Um, and the other thing that I get up to in the book is I say, you know, uh, I think identity politics doesn't have um, a unique set of problems, but it does have a set of problems that we should look at honestly. Um, and a better way of thinking about how to solve those problems is with constructive politics, which is also the same move I make on the reparation side of things. But um, one of the things that's gone wrong is people have traded a political focus on issues like recognition and um, representation in media and in universities and in governments for a sort of concrete nuts and bolts um, focus on what the activity of those institutions actually are, which sorts of people have access to education and housing and healthcare in the first place, um, and not just which people get to be in the room when those things are denied to the vast majority of the human population. 
And so if we refocus on building the kinds of institutions that can challenge the powerful, uh, my paradigmatic example of that are workers unions. Um, but the stronger those are, the better we'll be at building a world that will be fairer for women and for black people and for brown people and for whatever um, kind of identity based ways of thinking about politics that people might be interested in. Yeah, we've got some questions coming in on Elise Capture, which I'll, I'll get to towards the, the end. So just to, to bring us back to, to climate justice. So what what does climate justice mean to you? Um, how do you understand it? And how does this relate to the issue of reparations? Because this is something that, you know, for the most part, dominant discussions don't link climate justice and reparations. And that's kind of one of the uh, additional innovative parts of your book. Um, so yeah, what does climate justice mean, mean to you? Yeah, so, you know, I don't have what I would think of as a freestanding definition of climate justice, right? I think justice is a property of our political system writ large, right? Does it um, fairly allocate the benefits and burdens of social cooperation to different people? Um, and we could just ask that question with respect to um, different challenges that are um, that that system has to confront, one of which is, of course, climate politics, and in particular, the transition of a global economy from one based around extraction, especially, but not exclusively of fossil fuels, to one based on some other kind of productive and distributive principle. Um, that transition is going to create winners and losers, and um, ideally, the people that have to kick in their the lion's share of the effort should be the people who are on the hook for yesterday and today's pollution um, and yesterday and today's uh, marginalization of people. Um, but what we actually see in climate politics is the opposite. It's um, the people that have contributed least to the problem that are experiencing the most climate vulnerability not just because of where the floods are and where the hurricanes are, but also because of where the state capacity to respond to those um, problems is, which is actually um, a major determinant of what people's climate vulnerability actually is. We may not be able to tell the hurricanes where to go, but we can tell insurance where to go and we can tell uh, relief where to go. And those things, uh, strongly track the wealth of communities and of nations. So unsurprisingly, from that way of framing things, the wealth that has accumulated over past generations, which includes lots of economic innovations, but also lots of fairly naked political domination, um, that is a decisive factor, not a solely decisive factor, but a decisive factor in um, explaining which people are vulnerable to the worst impacts of climate crisis today and which people will be winners and which people will be losers as opportunities open up in a new you know, clean economy and as new sites of extraction open up to service that new clean economy. Hmm. So what I what I liked and what my students liked about, about your book is is that in a sense it offers a more hopeful and optimistic perspective on reparations. Um, so you argue that reparations are not only a moral duty or a legal obligation, but they're an opportunity to imagine and create a better world for everyone. So my question is, could you elaborate a little bit more on your constructive view of reparation, as you as you call it, and how this serves a better world making project? Maybe you might kind of clarify that a little bit for the reader. And uh, and what are some of the benefits and advantages of adopting this constructive forward thinking view of reparations? Yeah, so sometimes I use the term world making uh, borrowing from 
colleagues who have uh, really, I think, showed the utility of that way of thinking, including Adam Gerachu. Um, sometimes I use the phrase constructive view, um, and I talk about a constructive project to build a different social system. And one thing that I try to stress every time I talk about this is just precisely how literal I'm being. I mean, literally constructing things. Like I'm not using, it's not metaphor, right? Um, and the way that I explain it in the reparations book, the example I give is um, a trend in disability justice activism that was called universal design. But they were they were actually challenging how literal buildings were constructed. Do they are they accessible by stairs, in which case you have to be able to use stairs to get into the building, or are there ramps, in which case a larger variety of people who are mobile in a larger variety of ways can access the building? You know, that is in part a moral ethical question about who should have access to buildings, but it is very importantly a literal physical question about what the mode of access to a physical structure is. And in exactly that same sense, I'm trying to say we should be thinking about um, making changes to our social structure. So there are going to be new, yes, political institutions. Um, so building a political institution is um, not the same thing as building a ramp, but it is no less concrete and real. You know, it is either the case that there is a participatory budgeting process by which people make direct democratic decisions over how money is spent in their city or there isn't. That is a, a thing that could be built, that could come into existence um, if people decided to build it um, and could be a way that we decide how and where money goes, uh, but we would have to build something like that. We could have a universal basic income where um, everybody gets a basic income, a basic amount of uh, access and claim rights over the goods that are produced by globally distributed human labor. Um, we could allocate those things in ways that were sensitive to the history of slavery and colonialism, uh, particularly in the United States. African-American descendants of the enslaved could be first in line for all of the above. Um, those are decisions that we could make. Those are things we could build um, I think, um, you know, obviously those are examples of things I think we should do, um, but uh, they are, you know, literal initiatives and not frames of mind or, or not just frames of mind or political perspectives on a series of problems, but we should be asking in a literal physical sense, you know, what the system is that we are building, what its features are, and we should be thinking that literally about features that we want to add or subtract from the world as we find it. Yeah. And, and that kind of links to, you know, in terms of climate, when we're thinking about the Green New Deal, you know, we're, we're saying everything must change within that, that framework as well. Um, so the, the kind of criticism of this type of approach would be, you know, we're, we're stuck in uh, cycles often dominated by electoral cycles, short termism, incremental reforms. But in your in you know in your book and your broader philosophical work, you've emphasized the need, as you said, to remake the world. You know, we must change everything. Okay. My question is: Can you elaborate a little bit more on why it's important to establish a clear vision of what a just and fair world should and could look like? even if this vision seems politically impossible in the moment? You know, what is the value of setting out almost utopian visions for society? That's a really interesting question. I think it occurs to me to say two things. Um, maybe the first thing that I would say off the bat is just, you know, my belief is that the world already limits us, right? There's already a power structure. There's already limited resources and time. Um, we don't have to limit ourselves, right? Um, the world will certainly impose its limits on us. So the 
most basic thing I think to say in response is that I don't actually see the danger in just thinking, what is it that we want? You know, if we could do anything, what is it that we want? I do see the danger in staying there and staying in a, you know, purely utopian frame of mind. You know, if we did, if we had no restrictions, what would we, what would we build? Um, but I don't see the danger in starting there that at least, you know, some of my fellow travelers politically uh, seem to see. And, you know, the second point I make, I think, kind of launches from that one, because if I'm trying to get in their head and understand why people are resistant to, you know, what they think of as, you know, pie in the sky, impossible demands, I think they think something like this. Well, um, society imbalances of power, those things impose real constraints on what you can accomplish. And if you're not willing to be serious about those constraints, then you can't um, expect to accomplish even what is possible. Um, I think that is entirely true. And that's the reason that we should have utopian thinking. Right. Or that's the reason why we should just ask directly, what is it that we want? Because, you know, I'll just use worker organizing as an example. Right. Um, in fact, let's not even have it be that abstract. Let's talk about Ford and GM right now. Right. Uh, if you had asked the bosses, as auto workers, in fact, did. Right. The bosses will say, well, here's the things you're allowed to negotiate, and here are the things we are prepared to even talk about. Um, and this was the same in the case of the, the Hollywood writer strike, um, SAG-AFTRA. AFTRA. Um, and that list will be suspiciously close to the list of things that they're willing to give you, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you allow the status quo as it is to set what is even negotiable, what we're even allowed to aspire for, that is inherently conservative frame of reference, right? It is because the United Auto Workers built an unprecedented amount of power and militancy that the very terms of what could even be contract could even be bargained over in their contract negotiations shifted as they exercised that power with the strike. And I think that is the that is actually what it looks like to be serious about what constraints are, right? You have to um, have a clear vision of what it is that you want um, and have a clear vision about how you're going to build power to get the things that you want and it is only after that that then the constraints of what is in fact possible and what is in fact realistic um should drag us into something other than pure heaven on earth mm -hmm. right but we should start from thinking about very directly what are our needs what are our practical goals um and we can accomplish as much of that as we have the power to accomplish and and you 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 mention unions quite a lot in in Elise capture and and reconsidering reparations as well and, and particularly the concept of bargaining for the common good so this is a, a a term that describes a strategy of collective bargaining that aims to benefit not only the workers but also the wider community and society so um Maybe just some comments on bargaining for the common good. You know, why why is this an important part of of the union movement, and how can it feed into the types of visions you put forward in in either or of your books? So, the reason one of the reasons why it's important is because of the kind of organization that uh, a union is, and I you know I think we are rightly reverent and thankful and grateful to past uh, activist struggles that have made um, important gains by kind of moral suasion tactics um, and have um, argued and organized around a vision of the good. But I think what is important and 
potentially helpful about organizations like workers unions is that they have coercive power, right? They can say not just this is our version of the good and this is what we think should happen, but they can also say, if we don't get it, here's what we're gonna do and here's why that's bad for you, right? I think there are limits to the potential strategic utility of forms of organizing that rely at the end of the day, either on the uh, conscience of the actor that you're negotiating with or with the susceptibility of that actor to shame from third parties. That That is a strategy for success, um, but I think a strategy I would bet more on is uh, one where if the powerful don't give us what we want, they don't get something that they want. And so the workers union has the leverage of uh, slowdowns, of working through the political process, but ultimately the, the, the strike, right? We can withdraw our labor if you don't meet our demands. And that kind of leverage is important. Uh, it's not unique to workers unions. Um, for example, tenants unions can withhold rent. Debtors unions can withhold debt payments. Um, any and all of those strategies are worth pursuing, but the kind of strategy where um, something of value to something that the other side already recognizes is of value to them is withheld in the event that they don't meet demands is a stronger negotiating position than one in which you just try to convince them or convince you know the people of the world that your cause is just. Um, I think some combination of those, but an emphasis on the leverage part is called for politically. Mm -hmm. And and this leverage is important when we're trying to create um, tipping points for for social systems. So, um, you know, talking about challenges, so we have to cut uh, emissions almost by half within a decade. And just for the, the folks watching, mm -hmm. that's around seven point six percent of pollution cut every year. Uh, to put this in context, despite global efforts, emissions have risen every year over the last two years. So it's a monumental challenge. But what, what I like about your book is not only you're going back, looking at historical movements and, you know, thinking like an ancestor and, and you know, having multi-generational perspectives, you discuss historical events like abolition of slavery and other major political ruptures where seemingly st stable systems reach tipping points. So my question is, can you elaborate a little bit on your views regarding the existence of tipping points within social systems? Um, how can we learn from these historical moments to better understand and navigate the complexities of the current climate challenge? So uh, tipping points is something that I've learned from colleagues that model systems and do systems thinking, um, particularly ecological systems. There's also, you know, emerging study of what they call social ecological systems that tries to integrate what we understand about human societies into how we understand the ecologies that we are a part of, right? And a thing that people find is that there is often, you know, what they what you would call non-linearity, right? So often uh, the change from, you know, a small variable might cause, you know, cascading changes to the whole ecology. Um, that's just one example of what a, a tipping point might be in this context. And while they're difficult to identify in advance, we do just see large scale historical change happening. And 
one of the points I really wanted to impress upon the reader um, is that the kind of change that we're thinking about isn't unprecedented. You know, for good or ill, we have seen these large planetary scale changes to aspects of our social political system already. Abolition was one such change. Um, the decolonization of much of the world in the 20th century was one such change. The Industrial Revolution was one such change, right? There, it, it is demonstrably, not just hypothetically, but demonstrably in our power to affect how human social systems and economic systems are put together at scale. The question is, um, can we, again, do this in a way that advances the cause of justice rather than um, destroys that cause? And I don't see any reason to rule out in advance that we could. Hmm. And, I, and I guess, you know, you, unions and youth movements and, and, and bringing you know, transnational movements together are, are a, a key part of that. And, you know, we see little examples, like even something as small as a divestment movement, how that started off in university colleges here and, and sparked a pretty big uh, movement worldwide. Um, in, in your books as well, you, you also draw on insights and experiences from various black political thinkers like James Baldwin, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Nikisha Taifa. Uh, to develop your perspective on reparations. Um, could you talk a little bit about folks that have inspired you uh, and shaped your thinking? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Taifa and the um, Republic of New Africa movement, um, the anti-colonial movements, especially of the 60s and 70s, um, the 1960s and 70s, uh, that is, um, these are movements and collections of thinkers that really loom large in my thinking. Um, in particular, the, the argument that I take myself to be making and reconsidering reparations is what I, I think was, if not a consensus view, then maybe a plurality view among anti-colonial activists of that period. Um, but in both of those kinds of cases, they were looking to make real local kind of concrete changes to their political circumstances. The Republic of New Africa was trying to seize territory for a Black nation in what was then and what is now the United States. Um, anti-colonial activists were trying to secede from formal colonial domination by particular powers, Portugal, um, England, France, and set up their own countries. And all of them, or rather I should say the, the activists who I am most inspired by, the thinkers who I'm most inspired by, Milka Cabral, uh, Lilika Boal, um, Walter Rodney, they all were pursuing these goals in the full knowledge that the full system that they were trying to change was bigger than their particular struggle. Um, and so they linked the various struggles, um, the Lusophone African independence movements were in particular quite tightly linked, uh, the movement for independence of Angola and Mozambique and uh, Guinea-Bissau, um, the, the entire African continent of movements. Uh, there was uh, strong solidarity in the anti-apartheid movements across the entire world. Um, many of these movements were getting shipments of books and anti-aircraft missiles from Sweden and the then Soviet Union and, you know, even uh, detachments of soldiers from Cuba. Everybody understood that they had to, that there was a, there was a fight in front of them, but there was a broader fight beyond that one. And 
the contribution they could make was fighting the fight in front of them with an eye towards helping other people do a version of the same thing where they were at, right? And so, you know, the the people in Guinea-Bissau didn't drop their struggle to go parachute in to a Cuban struggle, right? They they fought the struggle that was there to fight, but they, you know, they understood that they were doing something that harmonized with what other people were doing where they were at and the people that supported them understood the same thing and among the many kinds of inspiration i draw from that is trying to understand how people respond politically to the problem of scale which is a defining problem of the climate crisis we have this massive planet whose ecology is messed up we have this massive economic system that in many, many, many ways is dependent on coal and oil and gas. And, you know, if we're lucky, you know, we have a roof to put a solar panel on, right? If we're, if we're very fortunate, right? How is it that we respond to a struggle that large with any kind of action at the level of us as individuals or even us as groups that we might be in um how how is it that we don't just get lost in the scale of that thing and i don't really again you know i have bits of practical advice in the way of you know support unions bargaining for the common good and so on and so forth but i don't pretend to have anything like a blueprint of how we respond to that problem. The only thing I can take solace in is that people actually did it before, right? We know it can be done because it has been done. And we live in the world that is the product of the fact that, that people did it very recently, you know? Like these are, these people are my parents' age, you know? Like we can, you know, we can just go talk to them. You know, any of us could get on a plane to Cuba or Guinea Bissau, just ask people, you know, what was up during the 60s and 70s and how did you do this thing of literally changing the world um but you know we can take solace from the fact that it's been done to realize that it's available for us to do now that that reminds me when i was at the paris climate talks at a at a seminar and uh um the marches were cancelled at the time because there was a terrorist attack in in uh, prior to the um, the climate talks and uh, a lot of the uh, climate activists in the room we were in were very upset but there were some leaders from the ej movement at the top and they were kind of smiling at each other saying marches get cancelled because you could sense that they were bringing with them the experiences of you know the civil rights movement and uh, to them, one march getting cancelled didn't mean anything, and uh, it was it was just an interesting moment. Um, so so bring us back to thinking a little bit about colonialism and making those those connections. So your your book describes how European countries and their industrial offspring, so like U.S., Canada, Australia, were built on the wealth of extractive colonialism, uh, which they used to industrialize and build the fossil fuel economy. And you also outline how the global social structure that resulted from transatlantic slavery and colonialism, you call it the global racial empire, resulted in advantages accumulating in the global north and racially dominant communities and disadvantages or liabilities accumulating in the global uh, uh, in the global um, north or south, I should say. So my question, can you speak to the various ways in which racial capitalism or global racial empire created conditions which made countries in the global south more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and what are the ways in which climate and colonialism are linked and then after this we'll go to the the the, the q a if people have got um questions so so how are our our colonialism and climate linked in terms of creating vulnerabilities so one of the ways that they're linked is just in the distribution of wealth itself. Um, and this is something that I think plays a powerful role. I wouldn't go as far as to call it to the 
um, unitary role in saying who is vulnerable and who is not. Um, but it's it's close to that. You know, many of the other variables that are of importance when it comes to predicting climate vulnerability and predicting vulnerability to premature death in general um, are very tightly linked to wealth. And the wealth development of the course of the past few centuries was just very explicitly linked to the imperial organization of the past few centuries. Um, from uh, a number of the centuries stemming from the 15th century, the European powers in particular that were doing the lion's share of the colonizing subscribed to um, a mercantilist ideology about how economies should be managed, which was directly about um, acquiring favorable balance of trade and accumulating uh, precious metals. Um, this is a phenomenon that, of course, shifts, particularly as free trade becomes more what the cool kids are doing. Um, but the control over the nature of trade and the gains from trade is a continuity between the mercantilist system and the one that develops, although the emphasis um, tends more in the direction of corporations than the wealth of nations starting from 19th century. But um, what you eventually get are big behemoth countries and big behemoth corporations trying to pick winners in economies and pick winners in politics. Um, the 20th century version of the picking winners in politics, when it goes to both pol policies and politicians, is very famous. Um, there's a big sprawling literature on neoliberalism, in some cases, the removal of uncooperative politicians, particularly in the global south by coup, um, and in many more cases, the encouragement of market-friendly policies by the existing politicians in the form of um, the Washington consensus and structural adjustment policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but whether we're talking about the 16th century or the 20th, we're talking about a political and economic system whose most powerful actors took a very interventionist take on economics and politics in places across the globe, across the borders that were being set up in the countries that were being explicitly set up by the um, colonists and their corporate collaborators. And an explicit rule of who could own what and who could have the political rights that were conducive to uh, building familial wealth and familial political ties were explicitly racially stratified for the vast majority of this history. Right, So there were a class of people that were um, paradigmatically, though not always, enslaved, and there was a class of people that were paradigmatically, but not always, um, of the class of people that could, wealth permitting, buy other people, and there were a there was a class of people that were somewhat in between those two extremes. And the political rights that each of those had and the political protections that each of those had varied in ways that were, again, very explicitly reasoned about. Like you could have looked up what rights the um, mixed race people had in the French colonies or the Spanish American colonies, um, and you could look up what rights the um, white European born people had and the white um, New World born people had and the Black New World born people had. Um, and you could look up the rates at which those people accumulated land, wealth, and property, and you would see roughly the same stratifications. 
And this is something that has had intergenerational significance. Um, and so even if, you know, by some magic, the 21st century had erased the intellectual, moral, and cultural residue of those things, you would still just have the differential rates of wealth acquisition and access to political office um, that help explain the difference in political um, outcomes and wealth outcomes in different parts of the globe. Mm. And, and that's a, an, an important connection that, you know, I guess historically people have, certainly within the climate movement, have failed to make those, those connections. So now I'll, I'll jump a little bit back and forth between the, the uh, Q&As. Um, so I have a question here from Professor Avi Chomsky. So Professor Avi Chomsky is a professor in Salem State. She teaches in the history department, and she also has a new book, 40 Questions About Climate Justice, which is, is really good. I would recommend to our, our audience as well. Um, so uh, Avi's question is, do you think your books and your approach can help us make sense of how people are responding to the events in Israel and Gaza? Um, I think the elite capture book might be relevant, but I think, you know, far more relevant are, you know, the works of people that have specific subject matter knowledge in, you know, the very complicated history of that region of the world and the, um, various political decisions that led to the situation that we have that is unfolding now. Um, I guess the broad thing that I would say um, is in, in terms of connecting it to elite captures specifically, is that everything I said about um, global racial empire, racial capitalism in general applies in this case. You know, there are people, there are outside interests with vested interests in manipulating Palestinian politics and Israeli politics and picking winners, right? Um, uh, various Israeli politicians uh, were um, invested in particular parties of the that represented Palestinians coming to prominence, which Hamas was reportedly one of those, right? Um, and uh, if we look at the is Israeli case, the US has security interests in having an ally in the region, and that accounts for the level of military aid and the level of military support that it's getting even now as the war unfolds. Um, and so those interests, I think, probably meaningfully in Israel and Palestine, as they do everywhere else, diverge from the interests of most people. I don't think it is in the interests of most people, Israeli or Palestinian, for there to be a hot war, right? I don't think any war is in the interests of most people. I think we end up in wars um, because... you know, the powers that are um, get to send people to fight and die for causes that will enrich them. Um, and I don't think this is any uh, exception to that general rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, another question here on, on Green New Deal. So just... Most people are familiar with the Green New Deal, but I'll just describe what it is. So it's an integrative policy program that aims to mobilize society economic resources around a transformative vision of rapid uh, of decarbonization. So when you're talking about world making, you know, Green New Deal is is part of this grander uh, vision on you know tackling rapid decarbonization, socioeconomic justice, and underpinned by a governing philosophy in which the state is conceived as legitimately having a central and creative role in the economy and a theory of change that emphasizes mass politics. And it's become uh, uh, 
a, a popular mobilizing force, certainly within the US and, and to, to internationally to a certain extent. So the, the question that come in is, Green New Deal proposals as envisioned by US politicians are largely or not internationalist or global in focus. What would a just global Green New Deal look like and what would some of the key components or demands of a global Green New Deal be? Yeah, a lot to say on this. Um, maybe I'll just identify three things. Um, so I think one aspect of a more genuinely global Green New Deal would be a more serious emphasis on improving public transportation for people in the U.S., right? That is a point of convergence and overlap between the interests of people in the U.S. and the uh, larger globe. I think the the this is something we've researched at climate and community project which is a, a group of researchers that i'm a part of um, but my colleagues produced a report you know identifying the level of extraction that would be required based on the extent to which the us um revolves around a sort of electric vehicles only version and vision of a Green New Deal versus one where electric vehicles are part of a solution that includes um, big expansions to train and rail and buses. Um, and it's the latter that puts less extractive pressures on the rest of the world. So um, that would be part of it. Um, I think a robust US support for debt cancellation in the global South would create fiscal space for global south governments to spend less on debt service and more on um, shoring up their social services and i think more aggressive emissions reduction from the u.s would make our air and water cleaner um, while um, polluting the one planet <laughs> the one air that we all have to share um, and using up less of the global carbon budget um, that um, I think other developing countries need. Um, so the thing I'm trying to emphasize across at least number one and number three is the convergence of interests between, you know, most Americans who are not Exxon executives and the rest of the world. Yeah, and you mentioned the Climate Community Project and and you guys do um, really cutting edge research on the intersection of climate and equality. So for any of you that haven't seen any of the reports from Climate and Community Project, I'd strongly recommend them. And they've been hugely influential in, in uh, informing thinking and legislation that has been introduced to, to Congress. And to me, it's a, a classy example of how academics can um, uh, influence change in in real world sense okay i'm going to jump down to another question here that's linked to the land back movement and reparations so the question from the anonymous attendee says regarding reparations how do you connect that to the concerns or demands of indigenous communities such as the land back movement are these separate or supporting or supporting or at least complementary arguments um, I would hope supporting or complementary, um, but part of the reason why I kind of left that open in writing the book is because I don't, you know, like most things about this, you know, it's not really up to me, right? Um, so one of the reasons that I gravitated towards towards um, Nkechi Taifa's work, um, Dr. Taifa's work, and um, the Republic of New Africa which he was affiliated with, um, is because their plan, which I mentioned earlier, for the um, building of a Black nation in the United States, in the territory now claimed by the United States, was put a bit carefully, right? Um, so their framing of it was they wanted the U.S. to cede 
its territorial claims to five states in the Black Belt in the South, um, the point of which was to open the possibility of a negotiation between um, Black Americans and indigenous, uh, indigenous folks about what to do with this land. The idea behind that being that some kind of negotiation, some kind of brokerage between those two actors would produce something that was neither um, what the U.S. was um, before um, the Virginia Company and before Jamestown, nor what it was during the reign of the United States but a new thing that they would build by some kind of uh, agreement. And I think that's what I would envision for the relationship between reparations and land back. You know, there are a lot of complicated land questions, um, indigenous, you know, all this is indigenous land. Um, at the same time, many black farmers were dispossessed over especially the 20th century. Um, and that land loss and wealth loss plays a big role, particularly in the South in explaining um, the ongoing shape of racial oppression there um, to use the US examples, right? Um, but just to bring it, just to bring back, uh, no. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's that's what I would say. Um, they they're at least possibly supporting, but that would need to be something that was built um, out of an actual set of political processes agreements, rather than something that is already there conceptually. Mm -hmm. So, j jumping topic again, so. Um, folks are interested to know your thoughts on degrowth or the degrowth movement. I, I know that uh, previously on this webinar, I had Matt Huber, you know, who's a, a, a strong uh, <laughs> a, um, <laughs> against degrowth. I then had Avi Chomsky also speak on this, and Avi is a strong proponent for degrowth. My Twitter uh, <laughs> feed, you know, for the most part is often, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure you're the same way in terms of, you know, what can you make not make sense of this debate or just what, what's your thoughts on, on this, on, on the debate over degrowth? So my, my headline thought about the debate over degrowth is that it's a very bizarre debate. Um, because from my point of view, what we are debating about is the answer to a math question, but nobody's doing the math for the most part, right? Um, or at least the the conversation in social media and the sniping back and forth between academics is not based on different answers to the math question. It's based on like different vibes about whether growth is like a thumbs up or a thumbs down word. And I just don't think that is how we should be debating these topics, right? So, so my understanding is that you know degrowth was a um, intentionally provocative label for a set of skepticisms about the centrality of GDP to economic planning or lack thereof, um, and the evaluation of the performance of an economy and the ecological significance of this became clear very quickly to the people who were trying to make this intervention and to the people who were, you know, first in line hearing this intervention. Um, and the thought is we should be trying in general, um, and I'll come back to the in general in a second, but we should be trying to reduce our material throughput. We should be trying to um, use less materials, use less energy, um, and in general, we should expect once we've done all the various less things that in some parts of the world, GDP will contract, right? So so one of the reasons I get off the board with, with um, degrowth as the name for this frame is because you know, when I ask degrowthers, 
Um, and, you know, one of the things people often challenge you growthers with is what about the global south, right? What about the developing world? What about the parts of the world where um, there, there isn't enough economic activity? It's not like the U.S. where there's, you know, so much economic activity that we actually could maybe live better lives with less of it, right? Um, but there are parts of the world that isn't like that, you know, and the degrowthers that I know at least say no, you know, in South Sudan, in uh, Ecuador, um, in Panama, you know, those economies should expand. And it's the US and the EU that should contract maybe, or or parts of the EU, I should say, um, I shouldn't generalize, but right, but developed economies are the ones that should degrow and the rest of the uh and the other economies the other national economies you know to whatever extent a national economy is a real thing but um other countries should have bigger gdps than they have now um to which i say you know that sounds right but that's most countries you know or that's that's most people right like india and china is already you know getting to you know in the direction of most people so why are we generalizing from the you know from the frances and the united states and the canadas maybe of the world um so that's my little gripe about the name degrowth um but substantively i just agree right i i think gdp is not a well let me let me say this differently um, substantively, I agree that we should be trying to look for opportunities to reshuffle what parts of the economy are larger, like say solar and wind, and what parts of the economy are smaller, like the production of, uh, I don't know, really big SUVs or something. I don't know. Um, there, you know, there's a list of things, of things that we can do without and list of things that we could do more efficiently and we should be concerned with what are on those lists i i think that is right uh, and i i just don't care whether the you know whether you know if we if we did all the things if we made better healthier cities that polluted less and that got everybody health care and that got everybody union jobs um, and economic security and so on and so forth. And if we did all that, I, I just don't know that I would care whether the GDP sign was positive or negative, right? So so I guess where I'm at is uh, boo growth. <laughs> boo, maybe <laughs> boo math. I don't, I don't know. Like, why are we... <laughs> I don't care whether, you know, GDP goes up or down. That just isn't my question. That is entirely orthogonal to um, what I think about. Um, but I join them in being concerned about um, eco-modernism, which is a label. I don't know if Matt Hooger claims it for himself, but it's a it's a label he's often uh, he and other thinkers are are labeled with. Um, and I think we should be asking this question empirically. We shouldn't take it as a point of political principle that technology is going to make higher levels of efficiency in reach that should just be a question that we ask like if we installed nuclear could we maintain the you know these levels of extraction of extraction the rest of the economy so on and so forth like that's you know there's no reason to decide in advance based on the writings of marx or anyone else what the answers to those questions are we should just rigorously study what it's going to take to build a world in the shape of what we want and we should do the things that are required to get there yeah, well said. And now uh, that answer has contributed to our Twitter uh, timelines, probably <laughs> in the future. <laughs> um, I bet. Yeah. So, so the last question, and uh, we're we're gone over the hour mark. So, um, and I, 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 it's the kind of end of end of your book where you talk about thinking like an ancestor and revolutionary patience, and and that. That was a really nice way to end the book in terms of sit situating the crises, the multiple crises that we're in at the moment. Maybe could you just kind of like share your thoughts on thinking like an ancestor or, or you know, what you what you call revolutionary patience as well? So. Oh, this is this is the first time I've gotten to say this publicly. 
Um, so we'll see how it goes. But um, one of the things I've been studying recently um, is a debate that will be probably familiar to um, any Marx fans in the audience. But um, back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, especially um, amongst many Marxists, but especially the Russian Marxists, was a debate over um, stagism, as it's sometimes called, right? Um, does there need to be two revolutions? So the thought among some people was that you needed something like a bourgeois democratic revolution, right? That the actual first revolutionaries would be the capitalists, right? Overthrowing the old feudal aristocracies um, and proliferating the kinds of political rights that would then be good fodder for, you know, the quote unquote real revolution by the proletariat and the socialists. And, you know, they went back and forth. I'm sure people on Twitter are still going back and forth about, you know, whether or not that was the right view. Um, but what they were responding to was the idea that there are specific tasks there are specific preconditions for the kinds of changes that we want, right? We can't just realize that socialism is cool, for instance, is what, you know, that was the commitment of these people and it's, you know, my po politics, but, you know, whatever the target is, we can't just realize that the, the particular target is a good one and just end up there, right? There are things we have to achieve to achieve the ultimate goal, whatever that is. Um, in this debate, the idea was we're going to get a set of political rights that we can use to organize if the bourgeois democratic revolution happens first, um, and then we can use that to get the next revolution. In our era, you know, maybe the stages are, you know, something like a solar revolution and then a broader climate justice revolution, right? You know, like maybe the thing, maybe the precondition for being able to win a world that protects everyone is a world that is not five degrees Celsius hotter than this one, right? Like that just might be true. And I think, you know, revolutionary patience involves understanding what it's going, what it's going to take to get the conditions for what you want and you know um it kind of circles back to what we were discussing earlier right you can have the utopian vision but you have to understand what it demands of you practically um and i think those kinds of debates are helpful in framing that kind of large aspiration but you know whatever we're talking about whether it's degrowth whether it's the debate about national independence and the importance about national independence um for you know building a just world um or whether we're talking about responding to the climate crisis i think we have to take seriously the scale of the task at hand um and what intermediate goals will get us from here to our final most important ones and if all we can do in our lifetime, in our generation, is get the intermediate goals, that is more than most generations have been able to win. Um, and we should not look down at that. Um, but if we can get everything, let's get everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's 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 the goal. Um, well, Femi, thank you so much um, for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, my students are really enjoying your books and other students at Salem State are, you know, um, delving into them and, and is generating a lot of questions and, and thoughts and thinking and, and just like to thank you also for being such a public facing scholar for doing all these talks for having a a strong pro, uh, a profile on Twitter and other places, you know, that is is valuable to the to the masses to get access to all these these thinking. Thanks for your time. Thanks for everyone for tuning in for, uh, across the US and uh, further afield. And um, hope everyone has a nice night. And we'll see you all at the next webinar to be decided. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, y'all.
Okay.